Okay, this is part two, and we're gonna wait till the other students get back on board. We're talking to Maria. This is Art 101C, part two, April 8th, Wednesday, April 8th. And we got the student getting back on board. Back. Welcome back. We're talking to Maria about this painting telling the two sisters in Boston had a little tea party. Looking at all. Okay, we're coming back. Yeah. All right, Maria, are you there? Are you back, Maria? You're on mute. Ah, can you hear me now? Yeah. That's better. Okay, so we were talking about these two women, sisters, presumably having a tea party. What's weird about this tea party? Well, you just, you know, you're supposed to socialize. It's like social hour, but they don't look like they're really like socializing. They don't look like they like each other that much. Mm -hmm. So not only do they have their tea party, like with the crump crumpets and whatever you call them, snack snacky thingies, they call mm -hmm. them, whatever they call them. They, how are, what about their outfits? They're dressed very formal. And they, it looks like they got dressed up for this tea party or two, right? Yeah. So, uh, and, and it looks very, like that clothing, does it look comfortable? Does it look like, yeah, let's chill out and have a tea party. Very chill? Mm -hmm. No. Yeah, it looks like an incredibly uncomfortable ordeal. Um, is it worth it? What, so there's a truth here. And we're going back to what we were talking about as far as the truth here. The artist is clearly giving us a candid moment where we're not really supposed to be there. We're looking in, we're getting a sneak peek at this, the truth of these two sisters, how they really are when they are really hanging out and doing their thing. So they're having a tea party and they're, they look kind of miserable. So what's the truth there? What do you think the artist, why would the artist paint this? What are, what's the truth that the artist kind of wants us to see here? What, what are we caring about here? Um, just to show like, I don't know, sisterhood, family, I don't know. <laughs> that, that could partly be it. And I think um, it could just be as simple as just like, let me show you the honest sort of interrelationship of these two people. That's great. But mm. I would point out, do you see these two lemons here? Yes. So they have a sort of, if I said, well, those are very prominent lemons, what would be prominent about them? Well, I don't know. It's just odd that they're sitting there. One, it's odd. They're, they don't really... Do you, they're just there, right? Yeah, like, and they're like to the side too. Yeah, they're, and but they're also kind of the first. They're in the front of the painting, like very. They're definitely kind of right out at us, but they're not necessarily like clearly the focal point, right? That they are kind of outward, and they're just kind of there, right? Mm -hmm. They're not, and it, what is and it, what is a lemon? It's sort of a, a something you add the tea, right? But mm -hmm. it's sort of like by itself a lemon. It's just sort of like a tasteless kind of thing that you don't really have. It doesn't have really substance unless, unless, unless what? But it's sour. It's sour unless you can, you unless you do what with a, why do you, what do you need if, if you want a lemon? What, just by itself? Lemonade. Yeah, you need to mix it with something else, right? Yeah. Because by itself, does anyone want a lemon? Not really. I mean, they're great. God bless lemons. Any of you know any lemons? Like, I don't mean to offend any lemons, but lemons, like for me, are like I add it to something else. So, I hope you realize I can everything I've said about lemons. I can say about the women, like they, it's like a lemon, like all dressed up tea party. But who cares unless there's other people here at the party, right? They're kind of alone, oddly alone, like just sort of butting heads, like these two lemons, and completely sort of removed from the world that you would expect to see around a tea party. You've got this weirdly covered up mirror, which 
seems to kind of be another odd thing, like why are they sort of, it's a divider, it's a, something kind of covering things up, kind of like they're covered up in this clothing, this outfit, but they're not outside. And tell me about what's the weather like outside, Maria? Um, it looks probably sunny. Yeah, it looks it's like a sunny day. But it's bright, you know? It's a bright sunny day. Like, do you think it's, does it, is it cold out? No, because they're wearing think, short sleeves. Yeah, it might, it might be, but I don't think so. So what are they doing indoors? Drinking tea? Yeah, they're drinking tea. <laughs> I and, don't know. And, and, it's, and I think the painting is sort of like, I mean, I'm a little going off the deep end or off, uh, on a limb here, but I think the painting is sort of about how these two young women have kind of everything anyone could ever ask for, except other people to enjoy it with, right? Is that they kind of, yeah. I'm not saying that they're miserable per se, but I think the artist is looking at these two women dressed up with these creature comforts and just saying, really, you know, that is, they need, there's still something missing. And I think you could put this into the context of other paintings we've seen in this era, which is the artists are somehow aware that we're at a crossroads between like our grandparents and our children, like rural America, modern America, like, like people who watch TV and people who watch YouTube, right? The total, and in a way they're looking at these young women who are sort of, living examples of modern life with great clothing probably made by factories with things that you can get from all over the world from china it looks like exotic fabrics and yet they're cooped up in their homes kind of kind of like us online instead of going out and enjoying life and i'm not saying that's necessarily the message here even intentionally the message and yet there is enough in this painting that's odd that does seem to suggest you sort of grapple with something which is so obvious here, which is the fact that they aren't really having that much fun and they're sort of dressed up to have fun and they're, they're not really. So that's just a, a, a wonderfully nuanced way of looking at this or example of a painting that doesn't really offer a, a clear answer, but raises a lot of visual questions with oddly misplaced cues, including there's no real focal point here. Is the focal point the woman who's miserable? And if she is, that's kind of a depressing focal point given the circumstances, right? So there's just a lot that sort of undercuts itself. And I think you'll see that when we get to a painting in a moment. Uh, but I want to point out that in this era, in the 1900s, early 1900s, late 1800s, artists have a choice between photographing a scene like this or painting it. And I think you can see the merits of painting it with all the sort of choices they can make. But also what happens when photography comes on the scene is artists, painters, have to sort of choose, do I want a, an objective media, medium or do I want a more subjective medium? And one of the things that comes out of this crisis between photography or painting is, well, some artists say, why even bother um, with painting to capture things the way photography does? We should only paint things um, suited to what painting can do that photography can't. And you see that here with the advent of impressionism which is the impression of something rather than the objective reality. Painting no longer needs to compete with photography to, for capturing uh, a seascape, for instance. And instead, it's, it asserts its unique ability to capture the impression of something. And so artists really sort of discover that, well, if I want to keep painting and I want to do something that, that is uniquely painterly, well, let's, let's discover new things you can do with painting, such as impressionism, including um, abstraction, which you could say is a sort of form of impressionism taken to the extreme degree. Um, Alejandro, are you there? And thank you, Maria. Good job on that last thing. Alejandro, are you there? Yeah. So what do you, what is, what do you think I mean by abstraction? What does abstraction mean? Like something not like drawn exactly like the way it is. Right. And in fact, you could even say there's no reference whatsoever to the real world. Is this painting itself abstract or is it still have some some clinginess to the real yeah. world. It still has like some clean like of the real world. Like you can see people, ships, and uh, I think that's like a city or something. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Maybe uh, maybe like like here in Tampa, like the port you know, yeah. around Ybor or wherever you guys are. <laughs> so absolutely. And uh, it's important for you guys to understand that distinction Alex made is really a Alejandro is the difference is abstract has no basis in reality. It's pure, ab purely shapes and colors. And, and the reason why that is, is because photography doesn't do that. 
So if you can't have, if, if abstract artwork is hard to grasp, just remember it comes in the wake, in the, in the shadow of photography, when photography is much better at capturing the world than any painter could ever hope to be because it's accurate, it's objective. So painters do what a lot of people might expect them to do, which is discover, reinvent painting and do things unique to painting, like treating a scene like this with brush strokes and Alejandro. Yeah. So can you, what is, does this painting have depth? Um, not, I, I don't think so. What, um, does it follow the rules of perspective? It, it, for me, it looks really like they're like in the same like size, you know, they're giving the, uh, everything and the painting the same detail for me. So I don't, I don't think they're really like giving the sense of depth. I see what you're saying. I think, and tell me if I'm wrong. You're saying like the, everything in the painting, whether it's the stuff in the background, the foreground, none of it's given like, like photographic detail. None of it's given any sort of like extra exactly. attention. It all kind of yeah. is the same amount of work. Yes, yeah. absolutely. That's a great observation. And I would point out, and this doesn't contradict that so much, but there are certain details that stand out, not for the reason because there's more details, but because it's thicker or because there's more paint, right? Like the area of the ships, like on the sea. Well, which parts for you stand out, which parts of the painting stand out the most for you? Uh, the people like in the, in the boats. And, and the what thing. makes them stand out? Uh, the whole painting's like really like light colors, but that, those two are like really dark. They're great, bad. great. And even maybe thicker, the paint is a little thicker. And just that little subtle thickness of the paint and the fact that their, their color is much deeper and darker makes them stand out from the background. It also pushes them out to the foreground okay. and thereby pushing out everything which is very soft <laughs> and into the background. You see that? Yeah. And so sort of like a hazy atmospheric perspective. And don't get me wrong, you're absolutely right. Everything is treated with the same kind of minimal, minimal execution, minimal paint, and yet subtle little differences in thickness of paint or color will have much bigger results because of the sort of framework that the artist has set up here with a sort of very minimal brushstroke. And what's the other thing that stands out here, Alejandro, apart from the people on the boat? I'll say yeah, oh, by the way, Alejandro, before you answer, and you can see that they are absolutely smaller, or the things in the background, like the cranes, yeah. Those are smaller, or very small, because it is foreshortening, right? The artist is still a, a, applying the rules of minimal perspective because they are, in fact, cranes that would be much bigger. So the people in the boat, you know, are closer and bigger because they're closer to us. And so there is a sort of nominal sort of use of, it, of perspective. But what were you saying about something else popping out? Um, the sun. Yeah, the sun. And why does the sun pop out? I, th I think because, like, all the area, like the sky, is literally like the same color, which is blue. And then on the top part, it's like all these different colors, but the sun is only one color, which is- Great, blue. great, that's a good point. It's one color of orange. It's not like different colors, different shades of orange, not yellow, not bright orange, not, not white orange, but just orange. So it's not mixing any other colors. So it stands out because it's just one color. And yeah. you, what's the relationship between the sun and the sky behind it color-wise? What are those two colors called? Um, primary? Uh, not quite. No? Across from the color wheel. What do you call colors that are across from each other? Complementary? Complementary, right. And remember, those colors have the most contrast because it's the, yeah. the most uh, jarring distinction possible between two colors. And so they'll, they'll really have a lot of contrast. And that is another thing that makes the sun pop out, right? Yeah. And what's another, a third thing that makes the sun pop out more? You have, it's just one color, it's complementary, so it really contrasts with the sky. What's one more detail or one more thing about it that makes it pop out? What about what I was saying earlier about the thickness of the paint? Yeah, like it's more deeper, you said. Well, you can even see like the way the artist, you can almost see the brush, like it's just one yeah. brush stroke, like in a spiral. And you can see the brush stroke even, and it's like you just did it once. It's very thick, right? What else is very thick with paint on the canvas, Alejandro? Uh, the people on the boats, like we said. And be besides them? Um, I'll probably say like the, the ocean. 
What specifically? The, the area around the boats. I would say the light on the water, it seems to be pretty thick. You might have a smaller version, but when you yeah. see a bigger version of the picture, you'll see that the, the sunlight reflecting in the water is yeah. pretty thickly painted as well. And that kind of pushes it to the foreground is what makes it pop out, right? Yeah. So going back to that question of depth, I think now you see, even though it, at first you yeah. might think it's a very flat painting and, and impressionism absolutely doesn't. Uh, that we typically see, there, there's still a, a sense of depth going on. Yeah, and, it's, and remember, this is impressionism. So the artist wants to give you sort of a, a push-pull, like the water almost disappears, right? The figures are floating over like emptiness, it feels like, and yet the sun's dancing and jumping out at you. And even though this isn't naturalism, right? It's not capturing the world accurately. Anyone who's been to the ocean can tell you, when you look at the ocean, you don't really experience it as, oh, depth. Oh, perspective. Oh, anatomy. No, you feel the sort of da dancing ripples jump out at you and they hypnotize you and everything else blurs and you don't see anything. And that's how it feels to look at the waters, to sort of experience it on its own merits, which is lots of details on the surface, lots of weird things to catch your focus. And so the artists are really offering a different sort of naturalism, which is like the truth of our subjective impressionistic experience through our day-to-day -day life. You follow that, Alejandro? Yeah. Yeah, and I think you could, go ahead. Good, good, that was great. So I think you can see that impressionism here with these people. Um, Alejandro, what do you think I mean by that here? What is it, what is the impressionistic about this? Is this naturalistic? Is this ac absolutely photographic accurate? No, I'll, I'll say it's not, it's a more naturalistic since they're, they're seeing like the way the, their perception is of these people, like, uh, how they would portray, how they would act in a party, they think. Yeah, so, so there's, this is of course a lot closer to naturalism than this, but here you can see the artist is trying to capture the energy of, of yeah. the socializing, right? That brush stroke was sort of, most artists before this era would have hidden that brush stroke. You wouldn't have seen that because that would have been like, ooh, why, are you, why would you leave that? But now in the era of photography, painters say, oh wait, I wanna leave that because that's kind of how you see the world. It's like a bright, color day and bright there's like a haziness in the air and this is for me absolutely a true a, a different kind of truth about how it feels to be socializing right yeah uh let's see how about this one alejandro is this uh is this naturalism which is more naturalistic this one or this one Th that one that one right so this is a lot more like cartoony so yeah. this is a interesting painting and i think we're well we not, I won't end on this one but i want you guys to really consider something really important. And we've kind of seen a little bit of it, especially when we think about maybe this painting, which is what the people are wearing. And great job. I'm gonna pick up someone else now, Alejandro. Haley, how about you? Are you there, Haley? Can you hear me? Yeah. So what, are, what, what, what do you think about the outfits that people are wearing? Um, some of them look old fashioned, but like the one in the front, like the guy laying down looks kind of modern. It's funny, I had a student point that out. Like, he looks like he's a time traveler. He's got a muscle shirt on. He looks pretty relaxed. And I think that's a good observation. What about that, that clothing is, uh, feels more modern? <coughs> Haley. Um, I think just like the colors of it, it's more bright and just the way it fits him. What do you mean by that, the way it fits him? I don't know, everybody seems to be wearing a suit and more like um, baggy clothing. What would you expect to see people today wearing at the park? Would they be wearing what everyone else is wearing here or the guy on the left? No, probably like jeans and a t-shirt. Which is kind of like seemed like this guy on the left is wearing, right? And he yeah. seems to be the most relaxed, chill Omri at the park, right? Agreed? He's, he seems yeah. pretty relaxed. So we're kind of like looking at Plant Hall here. This is like Hillsborough River. There's the UT rowers and it is sort of like I guarantee it's the same era. The park next to UT, Plant Park, was built at the same time. And it was built the same way, like a leisurely park, stroll through the park, and people probably dressed just like this. So it's easy for us to not see what's going on here because we have modern clothing that we buy new all the time, and we dispose of it when we're done with it. What about these people? What about this clothing that they're wearing, Haley? Um, you said it looks old fashioned. Um, why do you think they're wearing such formal clothing in a park, which clearly is sunny and probably hot out? 
Um, that was probably just what they did. Do why? That. Why do you think it was more fashionable to be so formal in this era? Because uh, it was a more modest era, and they were more like um, religious. Well, it definitely like people there were less. Uh, today you can kind of wear whatever, show whatever, do whatever, right? And that comes from a whole pro proliferation of value changes, right? But one sliver, one very important sliver of those value changes is sort of our outward, the outward appearance of people, right? What does, what kinds of things, Haley, does the outward appearance of what people wear suggest about them? Um, like who they are, like you make judgments based off of like what people wear and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But, and, and, and even just if you make, you make, uh, proclamations as well by wearing something, right? Right. So what kind, what, might, what might you wear to make what kind of proclamation? Um, I'm not really sure what you're asking. So uh, if you say, I want to look like, if, I, if someone said, I want to look, uh, look uh, well, well, like professional, you would immediately have a bunch of things in your head. You say, okay, professional, probably not the guy in the lower left but maybe, you know, the other people in the suit and tie, right? But we we probably wouldn't think, okay, professional at a park, right? We would think of a park as like leisure. And yet, a lot of these people are dressed very formally. So there's something about them really wanting to show off their clothing here, right? It's almost, what, if I said to you, well, this, this painting seems to suggest they all are there to show off their clothing and not to enjoy the park. What visual basis do I rest that on? What do you think I'm looking at that tells me that? Um, well, I mean, I don't really know about that. Well, when people are at a party and they're dressed up, right? They're there kind I of- I mean, yeah, a party, but these people just look like they're walking and that's just like what they would normally wear. Uh, but I mean, we would think of a park as a place where you go to do what? Um, to en enjoy the weather. Okay, to enjoy the weather. And would you wear, therefore, a suit? I mean, no, but it looks like it's the middle of the day. Maybe these people are going during their lunch break. Yeah, absolutely. Could be, could be. Um, I think it looks a little bit more like a weekend to me, like a little bit more like a, just people, women, men, children, uh, kind of chilling. And that, that could be wrong, but I think that, uh, there's something underlying this, which is the sort of, there's a different value system here to going to the park. For us, going to the park, I think would be a lot more like that little girl in the back who's kind of running as we go when i think of a park at ut i don't think of people dressed up formally unless i think of like the kids going to the the, the dance formals like typically i think of people in hammocks chilling out with very little clothing on or much more casually dressed right that's what we would expect today right Haley? right so what what would be a reason why people might so if, if at parties people want to put on a little bit more of like a, they're, they're there to be seen, right? So there's, right. Some, there's something about kind of uh, the people going to a park to sort of put on an outfit, like a formal event. So what, is there anything odd about the way that people are interacting in this picture, Haley? Um, not really. They just kind of seem to be keeping to themselves. Well, that would be exactly the thing that I would say is a little odd. Um, I mean, and I might be wrong, maybe my idea is like socializing golf, but there's something oddly asocial about the scene, especially when you think about it compared to this, right? I'm not saying yeah. it's a dance per se, but even the people sitting down, they're looking at each other. That guy on the lower right checking out that woman, you know, the woman here on the lower in the middle is sort of looking off at someone else in the distance. You know, people are acknowledging each other. Like almost, this is almost like people on smartphones, the way everyone looks on their smartphone, like, they're all staring down at something. And I would argue that the clothing plays a certain role there. Um, and I think the artist here, you could say is making a picture that is both either a happy picture or maybe an oddly depressing picture. And I've had students write papers saying one or the other. I find it a little more fun to kind of engage in the, this is a miserable picture point of view. If only because for me personally, that the more I look at it, the more, you know, I think of myself as this little girl in the middle, right? We all grow up as little kids and she's got this white outfit on, so she's sort of innocence, right? You see the little girl in the middle there, Haley? You see her? Can you see her okay? Yeah. So she's sort of looking at, she, if, 
if she's the only one looking at us, right? Even the mom is kind of looking away, but the little girl seems to be looking right at us, right? Mm -hmm. And so she's sort of like the only one acknowledging people, which is us. And it's almost like, like when I remember being a little kid and I'm in some horrible situation, like my mom made me wear some outfit and then I'm looking out at some other kid, like sharing a moment of misery, like, hey, we're in the same boat. She's almost like reaching out to us, like looking at us, like, is this world, is, look at this world I'm going into, right? Any kid says that, like, look at this world I'm getting into. And what is that world like? The world is kind of people getting dressed up to be very uncomfortable. And I'm just saying this is sort of my own personal take on it. Even the monkey and the dog and the other dog, the little girl in the back, the musician, maybe they feel a little free and they're enjoying themselves. But everyone else seems very sort of to themselves, focused it on kind of on things and not on other people. No one's listening, looking at the musician. No one's paying attention to the pets, the monkeys. Um, and more importantly, the outfits seem very uncomfortable. Um, Haley, one last question. What do you think about that woman's outfit on the right? How do you, would you wear something like that? Um, that doesn't seem like something anybody would wear in this time unless we were dressing up for like a play or something. I don't think anyone would dress that even if we're dressing up in a play. Yeah, I mean, but like if it was a play about like these kind of times, maybe, but. Well, you mean, uh, you mean a theatrical costume and, and on stage. Yeah, yeah, that's right, what I'm saying. Right, okay, I thought you meant to go see a play. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree, I agree. <laughs> no, it's just like act. No, I, have, I completely agree with you. So we're, we're looking at clothing, which is very outdated. And what about it? And, and would you agree it's very uncomfortable looking? Yeah. What about it is uncomfortable, Haley? Um, it looks like there's a lot of layers and it's not like nice fabric. Okay, so it's very layered, like there's things underneath. There's, and what about the woman? Do you know what they're wearing underneath this sort of the waist there to get that sort of figure? Um, wasn't it like um, kind of like a cage thing or something like that? A, a corset, right? The way, yeah, under the dress, yeah. There's almost this bizarre like infrastructure going under the, under the dress. And the, inside the, the waist, there's a corset. So these women, especially men too, but certainly the women, especially, they're wearing this outfit, which requires like, like literally like, like tightening the drawstrings on your, on your abdomen. So it's really uncomfortable clothing, um, especially if you're thinking about going out into the park and wearing it. And I think the girl, little girl's outfit is, seems like a, a comfortable dress, but I certainly wouldn't want to grow up and have to wear any of these outfits uh, the women are wearing and underlying this sort of discomfort or what I would say is the reason why people dress uncomfortable there is a reason why people dress uncomfortably um, or dress with discomfort and why is that Haley I, I, I lied this is the last question why do people dress with discomfort um, to impress other people right to impress other people so and that's kind of getting to the main point I just wanted to point out here which is people are wearing clothing which is this is the first time in the history of the world the history of the whole world when people could wear clothing that blurred social boundary that's a blurred social status where anyone could buy factory made clothing and afford it and go out and wearing something really that their their parents couldn't wear that their grandparents couldn't wear because clothing is now industrialized which is like agriculture like everything in our world which means it's cheaply cheaper to make mass production, production and everyone generally can start affording it just like today where we can all pretty much afford to buy most kinds of clothing out there and it's very much harder arguably to sort of um, to have one fixed outward appearance of social class because anyone can afford to at least a Lamborghini right and so I think this picture you could say is a picture about people chilling out on the weekend but it also I think is a picture about the artist reflecting on a changing world with people adjusting to these changes, literally putting on, wearing this new world. And there's something oddly not quite sort of like pleasurable about it, at least for me. Um, and I think that little girl staring out at us really is the link to like sort of, she's reaching out wondering, and she's not wearing colors. She's the one person without bright colors. In a way that references the clothing to me. Um, so I just, you know, offer that to you guys as sort of, a, a starting point to start thinking about the modern disposable world we live in and imagine having to weave clo or sew clothing by hand how much time that would take imagine how much um, you would wear the same clothing every day you know you would really 
have a whole different mindset towards the world. And having the ability to wear new clothing every day is sort of a, a, a big game changer because it's the outward appearance of who you are is sort of, is, is everything to everyone else, right? And people are dressed very just uncomfortably here, I think, because they are trying to sort of impress others with their sort of, we've, we've reached, we've reached uh, that, the top. So, uh, yeah, I think that's a good spot to end. We're going to pick up on the post-impressionist on Friday, the likes of Van Gogh and others, who go even further with uh, impressionism. And we're going to see how a lot of this took inspiration from artwork from Japan and the sort of blending of artwork from all over the world as part of the sort of globalization effort and the sort of cross-pollination that continues today on the global stage in the art world with Vincent van Gogh taking the colors and the subject matter. You can see how his artwork evolves from this to this. You can see the influence of Japanese artwork, both the bright colors and the sort of um, wood carving mark. And so we'll pick up with Vincent van Gogh on Friday. Does anyone have any questions about anything? I will be in touch with each of you individually about your paper. I've gotten in touch with one fourth of the total students so far. I'm impressed by that. And I will keep working on that mountain this week. Um, any questions, anyone? Uh, I know, I don't think I, I have you guys, maybe I have you on mute. <laughs> so maybe no one can say anything. <laughs> Let me see. Uh, are you yeah, able I, to talk about uh, my outline right now after class? Sure, sure. We, is, everyone can hang up. I'm going to stay on the line with Robert. Bye, everybody. Have a great day. I'll see you on Friday. Good work. Keep up the great work, everybody. Goodbye. All right, Robert, are you there? And I got Joshua there, too. So, Robert, what's going on, buddy? Um, you emailed uh, me and said um thanks if we can talk about it yeah let's go ahead and talk about uh, uh your um, your outline you emailed it to me right yes and what's the uh, painting you were writing about again i'm doing uh the last supper and the last judgment okay and you sent an outline yes All right, here we go. Just open it on. Last Supper, Jesus Crowned by Apostles. Good focal point, Jesus. Jesus. Okay, yeah, I think that's good. So, that's, I like your thesis. I think the main thing you have to prove is just connect the, are you there, Robert? You hear me all right? Yeah, I can so hear you. I, the main thing I would connect is the, the sort of me questioning my morality, and you do this fine, I think you did this fine. Me questioning my morality and composition and movement, right? Uh, so make sure you uh, cross, I make sure you go back. It's all good, it's all good, that's funny. It's exactly <laughs> is that Josh, what you're saying about? You're uh, muted currently. Oh, I don't Hey, Joshua, you all right? Hold on, Robert. Oh, there you go. He's gone. There you there. Hey. You there? You there, Robert? Yep. We lost that. All right. So uh, here we go. So yeah, I think the I like the specificity of questioning our morality because yes, exactly. The whole point of Last Supper is to sort of that that. Jesus is implicating you as well. It, it's forcing you to question, am I, am I going to betray Jesus, right? This sort uh -huh. of, it, it starts with Jesus and like a water, like a, a pebble rippling away from him. That movement sort of eventually reaches you, right? And yeah. same with composition. That sets up that sort of world in which that movement can take place outwardly, right? From Jesus to you. So absolutely. I think if you just constantly make sure anything in the paper refers composition and movement just back to that sort of connecting spiritually to the viewer as sort of a moral reckoning the same with last judgment where you really sort of use i would say in that case maybe the movement um and you could say maybe a sense of composition up and down is morality so absolutely yes i, I, I talked about um they have heaven on the top and hell on the bottom 
Yeah, and you might maybe add just that uh, the last judgment, perhaps the nudity gives you another layer of, of spiritual transmission because nudity puts you back to sort of your original state of grace as a human okay. being. And I think that would be one thing you might add is just like, additionally, you know, a one layer that Michelangelo adds to this moral spiritual reckoning that you don't see in Da Vinci is the element of nudity, which almost sort of amplifies the, the movement and kind of gives you the final spiritual sort of connection to your common humanity. You know, we're all nude yeah. and you can't hide anything when you're, you know, your morality is not, can't hide when you're nude, you know? Okay. Yeah. But I think the, I, I can read it in more detail, but since I see a good thesis, I'm sure it's going to be a lot better without it. Just make sure your summary or your conclusion is a summary of everything. Uh -huh. Yeah, I definitely have to work on the conclusion more when I have the whole... Uh, yeah, I wouldn't exactly. Don't, don't even worry about the conclusion until you're happy with everything else. And yeah. then you just summarize. You say, in this paper, we compared the Last Supper to the Last Judgment. We saw how accomplishing the movement set up a spiritual, moral conduit reckoning. And we saw that, yada, 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 yada. And then you can maybe make some final afterthoughts, but they'll be clearer to you once you've kind of got everything else lined up. All right. Yeah, you're doing great. So we've talked, and yeah. if you need anything, I would say turn it a rough draft. Um, I mean, it's already kind of rough draft E, but maybe make any changes you think you might still need to make if you need to. Um, I would say maybe just give it one more look and then send it to me one more time. Just, uh -huh. or unless, would you like me to just kind of read it as it is and kind of just as a rough draft? Uh, yeah, if you want to read it as it is and then um, just let me know if, I, if you think I should do anything to okay. it. Okay, all right, I will. I'll get back to you. All right, sounds All good. Right. Have a great day. Keep up the good work. You too. Thank you. All right.